Welcome to Lesson 12e, Cascade Impactors. We're going to introduce cascade impactors, discuss how they work, and then I'll talk about some histograms. So first, the purpose. Purpose is to sample dusty air and analyze the particle distribution. There are other instruments that measure mass of particles and mass distributions and particle number distributions, etc. Cascade impactor is kind of like the gold standard. It's an old-fashioned technique that has been around for decades. The principle of operation is inertial separation, what we've been talking about. So a quick review, if this is an air streamline and this is a particle, the particle can't negotiate that turn so it veers off radially outward. So people figured out how to use this principle to actually measure the particle distribution in dusty airflow. So here's how it works. We're going to consider just one stage. There will be many such nozzles and plates, but we'll have one stage where there's a nozzle and a plate and there's some flow coming in at some flow rate Q. This is dusty air, so it would generally contain particles of various sizes on polydispersed aerosol. Well, the particles and the air come flying through this nozzle and accelerate. The air will tend to go around like that around the plate, and let's enclose this in a box here. Again, this is just one plate. There are many such plates and holes in a typical cascade impactor. So inertial separation says that big particles will tend to really veer off radially and hit the plate. We assume that when they hit the plate, they stick there. So the big particles will hit the plate. The smaller particles may or may not hit the plate. And then the really tiny ones pretty much follow the air, the really, really tiny ones. So it's a way of separating the big particles from the small particles. Well, this air eventually goes down. I'm drawing just one side. And then typically we have different stages. So we have another stage where we have an even smaller hole. And we also put the plate closer so that the next time through, this really has a much sharper turn. So if we think of it in terms of radius of curvature, this one might be a radius of curvature here, RM we've called it, whereas this one would have a much tighter radius of curvature. And so even some of the smaller particles would tend to inertially separate and then get stuck on the plate. So in general here, this first plate would collect big particles. The second plate would collect say medium particles and you keep going down, there could be eight or 10 stages and we keep getting smaller and smaller particles that tend to collect on these plates. This, by the way, is called an impaction plate or tray. When I have live classes, I bring one in to show you. I have some pictures here instead. In a real cascade impactor, these plates are able to be removed. So what you do is you weigh them before and after, and then the difference would be the weight or the mass of the particles that have been collected by that plate. So here's the procedure to actually use one of these. You weigh each tray empty. That would be your tear weight. You sample at this flow rate Q that we have up here. You're sucking it in. At the bottom of this, you have some suction device. You sample at Q for some delta T. And then you calculate the volume Q times delta T. This is the total volume of air that's sampled. When you're done, you weigh each tray again, and you subtract the tear weight. And that way you get MJ, the mass of the particles on that particular tray, J. We'll just call that, say, J equal 1, J equal 2, et cetera. For one tray or bin, we also call that a bin. We have CJ, mass concentration is MJ of that tray divided by Q delta T. So we have mass over volume since the volume is Q delta T, and that's our mass concentration for bin number J. And then you'd repeat that for all the bins. Finally, if you want the total, C total is sigma MJ over Q delta T. Remember here, J is the tray number or the bin number, not the substance. We've dropped that J subscript. So that's how it works. Here are some pictures. This is very similar to the one that I bring into class. You can see that there's nine stages since we start numbering with zero. The air comes in at the top and there's a suction device, a vacuum system that sucks it out. If there's no leaks, you have the same Q coming in and coming out. Again, you just sample that for some time and then you could use these equations to calculate the mass concentration for each range of particles. This is just a schematic diagram of what's happening, showing you that the big particles, this is a bigger one here, tend to hit that first tray. The medium ones will tend to hit the second tray here, and the small ones bypass the first tray, second tray, eventually they hit, and then you have the vacuum pump at the bottom. Typically, there's also a filter at the very end to get the really tiny particles that are left over. So as you go down from the top to bottom, this first couple stages would capture the big particles. 
then we'd have some medium-sized particles and some small particles down near the bottom, just as we show here in this sketch. Now, if we draw a grade efficiency curve, we can draw these for all these stages. Now, here's a different one that has just eight stages. There's also what's called a pre-impactor, which typically gets rid of some of the really big particles so they don't clog everything up. This particular one is a PM10 cascade impactor. So if you measure the total mass concentration, this would be PM10 for this cascade impactor. It's measuring all the particles that have been collected in the air that are under 10 microns. By design, the way these things are made, these grade efficiency curves are steep. You can see that they're almost vertical here. So pick any one tray. It has a very small range. They say this tray three here, or bin three, has a small range of particles, some bin size, where it collects those particles. And they're pretty separated so that not many particles are collected both in three and four, although there's always some overlap. Now, keep in mind that we go from top to bottom opposite of what you're used to, not left to right, but right to left, because the first stage is at the top collecting the big particles, and then the next stages collect smaller and smaller particles as you go down. And you can define cut diameters for all these guys. So this one particular stage, stage five or bin five has a cut diameter of one. But it would have a range. If you go from 10 to 90 percent, this range would be the range of stage five. And you can't tell whether those particles are one micron or they're 0.9 microns or they're 1.01 microns. You can't tell. All you're doing is measuring those, measuring the whole tray, you measure their mass. I did some CFD, computational fluid dynamic simulations of this many years ago when I was writing my indoor air quality book. I plot first the air streamlines. None of the air streamlines by definition can cross the plate or hit the plate because these streamlines cannot hit a solid surface. So they all just come through. Only the stagnation streamlines can intersect a wall. Then I have various particles that I modeled using the same equations actually that we learned earlier, where you can predict where the particles are going to go due to their equations of motion. And with inertial separation, some of those particles will hit these trays. Notice the diameter of the jet is large, medium, smaller. It gets smaller and smaller as you go down. I only modeled three stages here. And this is an axisymmetric model. Also, the tray gets closer and closer as you go down. So you have a very sharp turn by the time you get to this third stage. And that's why the smaller particles will be impacted. Here's one micron particles. These are particle paths, whereas these are streamlines. When I studied this, I can actually see which ones hit the plates and which ones kept going through. And a few of the one micron particles hit this third plate. None of them hit the first or second plate. Most of them just pass through. If we go to slightly larger particles, two microns, all of those hit the third plate. And then I kept increasing particle diameter, five micron particles. Almost all of them hit the second plate. One of my sample of particles hit the third plate. For the 10 micron particles, a couple of them hit the first plate, and then the rest of them hit the second plate. And then I did 15 micron particles, and all of those hit the first plate. So you can see that it works, and the simulations verify what we're talking about. So now I want you to think about this cascade impactor, one similar to it, where we've gone through the whole procedure that I talked about. So for each bin, we have a mass, and we know the particle range by the design of the cascade impactor. So we have this grade efficiency diagram at our disposal. And so now let's look at a histogram of the particle distribution. We'll plot MJ, the mass of that particular bin J, over the total mass that we've collected. Remember, this is after you subtract the tear weight of the trays. Plot that against particle diameter, and you will end up with something like this. And I'm purposely drawing these not all the same width because they aren't all the same width. You can see that from the grade efficiency curve. So some of them are fat and some of them are skinny. So let's do the case with eight stages. If we start counting at zero, this would be stage or bin zero, and then one, two, three, et cetera, up to seven. So there's eight stages. And each stage, let's look at stage five here, has some range of DP. We'll get into more of the statistics of this later on at the end of the course. By the way, the pre-impactor might be here for very large particles. That's sometimes even a cyclone or some other device that just gets rid of these particles. So for example, if you're doing a PM10 cascade impactor, which is a typical one, you want to get rid of all these particles that are bigger than 10 microns. So you design a cyclone to go right in front of that before it ever enters the cascade impactor. Otherwise, you have all these big particles that could clog everything up, ruin your measurements. Now, one thing you'll note 
marker, you should see here and notice that this does not look like a Gaussian. In fact, it's not a Gaussian, and you may or may not have learned this from your statistics class. Let's define a log normal distribution, which is typical for dusty air in some kind of a situation where you're measuring the dusty air. And all that means is this. If we have a distribution like I show here and you make a smooth curve through it, it looks something like that. So let's just plot that here. It's very skewed to the left and it has a big tail on the right. But if we plot the same data, mj over mt, as a function of either log dp or we put this on a log scale, we plot against log dp instead of dp, then this same curve ends up looking like a Gaussian, nice and symmetric. That's the definition of a log normal distribution. When you plot the distribution that looks like this on a log scale, as we've done here, a log scale for the horizontal axis, it becomes a Gaussian or normal distribution. So that's the definition of log normal. And as I set up here, that's pretty typical for the types of air that we sample in air pollution applications. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.